what in the world? I felt real smooth, too, like I could move my, you know, when you put the mic on, you can't really move, but now I feel really good. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, well, that's the start, so we can only go up from here. <laughs> wow, that's so funny. All right, good. I, lo I love moments like this. We are real people. I'm a pastor on staff at Grace Covenant, and I'm jacked up. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not what you may think I am. Don't let the smile fool you. Well, it's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord today, um, especially this day as we get ready for Veterans Day tomorrow. If you're a veteran, please stand to your feet. I want to honor you today. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your compassion for people that drove you as you served well. I pray, and I want to I pray this, that um, as a nation, we start to understand and we start to honor service. We've lost that art, whether it's your mother, her service to you, forgetting the honor, your father, whoever serves you, even the person who may clean your office space, to honor people for service, because that's what God is about. And so, so much more so, should we honor those who would sacrifice, who would be willing to sacrifice their life for the well-being of someone else. Can we pray? Father God, we thank you for our veterans. We thank you for those who are currently serving and those who have concluded and finished a good work. Lord, I pray that your grace would be upon them. Lord, that even tomorrow they would experience supernatural rest. And Lord, I'm asking for a surge in the spirit, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually for all those who have put themselves at harm's, in harm's way. May our nation never forget what the true servant, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for us. May we never forget the precious blood that was poured out. Bless these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are continuing um, our, our sermon series about men and women in the Bible, or men and women of the Bible. And today I have the privilege of preaching about Jesus. And uh, I want to make a disclaimer because I, I feel like, like I'm, I, I'm missing a major, major piece of clothing up here. I don't have my wedding ring on. Don't get it twisted. It's all good in the hood. <laughs> I sprained my finger. I can't put my ring back on <laughs> playing flag football, just being really goofy. So just I didn't want anybody thinking anything. Now let's shift back to the scripture. <laughs> Hebrews <laughs> chapter 4, 15. Hebrews 4, 15. By the way... <laughs> Men, you should feel naked when you don't have your wedding ring on. You should feel like something ain't right. You need to turn the car around. All right, now let's get back into the passage. <laughs> Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. You could have just been God, and that would have been plenty. But you decided to be Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Live the life we should have lived, died the death we deserve to die. Lord, you gave us hope when you rose from the grave. You looked back at the grave and said, I won. And because of that victory, we have the victory in you. And so we thank you that you are the high and lofty one. You are the high priest, yet you sympathize with us and love us and you're compassionate for us. Help us to walk in victory in your name. Amen. So the book of Hebrews, it's, it's unclear who the writer or who the recipients were of this book. Some people think it's Paul. Um, other people just have different thoughts, but that's not necessarily important as we study the, this passage today. Um, we are going to highlight one of my favorite words and one of the most complex words in the English language, 
rest. Rest. Raise your hand if you need rest today. Okay, good. So we're all on one accord. And so in chapter 4 and in chapter 3, there is, there is somewhat of an undertone, um, a desire for the writer to teach the people, the readers, to rest in God. Hebrews exalts the person, the entire book exalts the person of Jesus Christ and his wonderful works with a primary focus on Jesus and his incarnation, his substitutionary death, and his priesthood. These are the fundamental principles of our faith. You, going to church is not enough. Going to small group is not enough. Enjoying your favorite worship song is not enough. We must all individually come to grips with his incarnation, his substitutionary death, the fact that he replaced us. He died the death we should have died. This is the foundation and the fundamental principle of our faith that we stand on. And his priesthood. He is holy. Jesus is not your homeboy. Jesus is not your little friend. He's not your rabbit's foot. He's not your person that you, that you go to uh, when you need something. He's not a holy ATM. He is the son of God. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He was there in creation. He is eternal. He is immortal. That means that before time, he was there. He's outside of time even now. And as we're going through time, he's in time with us. And he's, he's on, the, on the beginning of time saying, go. He's in time saying, walk with me. And he's outside of time at the end saying, come to me. He's outside of the realm in which you and I call time. And this is the writer writing in these, in these different, we call them chapters, about who God is. I encourage you, even though it might be, might be difficult to understand, dig deep into Hebrews. Dig deep into Hebrews and be grounded and rooted in your faith. Because at the end of the day, when Jesus comes to you, he will not ask you about your mother who's a deacon. He will not ask you about how many times you came to church. He will not ask you about how nice your suit was and your Sunday's best. He will ask you, do you believe that I rose from the dead? Those who would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Christ Jesus rose from the dead. That is a conundrum. That is a difficult mental hurdle, and therefore we must have faith to trust Jesus. This particular passage highlights his nature. Jesus is compassionate. Are we happy about that? Jesus loves and he cares. Amen? I think we stumble upon that or we, we breeze over that sometimes because we, we, it's, it's said so many times, right? It's kind of like when you... Uh, on Christmas, you know, Christmas is coming, and, um, and even Thanksgiving, where a, a relative will make some great dish or give you a great gift, and they've been doing it for 20 years, and the, the thank you starts to fade. Like, the, the, the moment, where remember your first moment with that person? Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your parent. Oh, my goodness, it's so great. Thank you for making these yams. That's just me. Thank, thank you for that gift. I needed that. And it was just this deep, rich thanksgiving. Now it's an expectation to receive. And so we need to never live on the side of expectation, but the side of thanksgiving. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. You are a loving God. You are a caring God. I can tell that we haven't worked that muscle enough in the church, even right now. I'd like to take a moment to worship him because he loved you and cared for you. If you want to, stand to your feet and worship God. We have something called Prayer Shield on Friday. This is how we get down. We just praise God. We worship him for who he is. We pray to him every moment, every second of our lives. Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has been here for us. He, he sacrificed his life. He has poured out his blood that didn't need to be poured out so that we could be redeemed and transformed and brought back into the covenant. 
You can sit back down, but I want to, I, I want to maybe as like your physical trainer in the spirit this morning to help you with the functional strength of worshiping Jesus Christ. I don't want you to think that your only time coming to the gym, you know, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna get that beach body if you go once a week. I don't want you to think when you come on Sunday morning that this is your best exercise. Tomorrow morning, do what you just did. The next morning, do what you just did. But when you're with your family, do what you just did. When you're at work, I know it's quiet. You gotta be quiet. You gotta do it. You know, be strategic. But do what you just did. When you're in the car, turn down that that whatever you're listening to. That can wait. That's okay. Do what you just did. Let it be a repetition because your repetition is your reputation. And so what that means is, y'all ever had somebody that's always late, right? And then what they say when they get there, man, my bad, that ain't even me. It's not like me. I, that, that, or, or maybe they did something different, maybe they weren't late, and it's, that was out of character. No, that's your character. I know you. Your repetition, you've done it once, two, three, four, five times, that's you. That has become your DNA. Well, I want worship to be in my DNA. I do it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and it's a part of my life. It's in my inner being. In the same way that I need water, I need to get in the word. In the same way that I communicate with people, I communicate with Jesus. I want us to get into the practice. I'm a little excited this morning. Is anybody excited about Jesus Christ? Yeah. Rest is important. Sleep is good. Anybody got good sleep last night? Say amen. Amen. Sleep is good, but rest will sustain your life. Sleep is good, but rest will sustain your life. You know, um, I was on 495 with a good friend of mine named Yaron. And uh, we were were, were on 495, and and how do I say this without incriminating myself? I was going a little fast. (laughs) (laughs) Because we had somewhere that we had to be. And I don't know if you have any relationships like this with any of your friends, but I looked at him and I said, hey, man, I got to get it. And I got to get it. And in some other words might mean I got to punch it. And, I, I, and punching it in some other words means I got to put the pedal to the metal and we got to get to where we need to go. You're going to be safe, but we're going to get to where we need to go. I'm not advocating speeding. And I didn't even tell you that I was speeding. I just said <laughs> that I put the pedal to the metal. <laughs> All I'm saying is we were going forward (laughs) really well. And so as I'm driving, I look over to the side because, you know, uh, when you're driving, you kind of like with someone that hasn't rode with you before. He hadn't rode with me before. And you're looking over and you're like, okay, I want to make sure that he's good, right, that he's not uncomfortable. And this guy is leaning back in the seat and he's looking on his phone and he's reading stuff and he's doing things. He, there was a sense of faith, in, good faith in my driving ability. He probably could have took a, taken a nap had we not got to our destination so quick. <laughs> but I realized as I was getting ready to prepare this message that he had a good faith in my ability and in who I am. As his friend, he knew that I would take care of him. And so from that faith became trust. And he trusted my efforts. And from that trust, he was able to rest well. How much more so if we have a God who created all things by him, for him, through him, to him, in all things, he is good. He has the ability to transform situations. He has the ability to kill your cancer. He has the ability to transform your family. He has the ability to to, um, resurrect your finances. (laughs) And so because of that, we can have great faith in him. Not just in what he can do, though we know he can do all things because we can do all things because he's on the inside of us. But because of who he is, his nature, his character, he loves us, he cares for us, and he is there for us always. So as we grow in faith in him, we trust him more, and then we can rest well. Therefore, if you're ever struggling with rest, what I would ask you to do is check your faith life. Because if you're struggling with rest, it means that you are wrestling You are conflicted on the inside, and there are two 
dogs in your belly, as Pastor Chris Johnson says, and the one you feed the most will win. And so here the writer is saying, Jesus is the high priest, but he's able to sympathize with us, meaning that he dwells with us, meaning that we can rest because he's got our back. And because of that, we can be at peace. That's why he is the Prince of Peace. First point I want to talk about is his highness. He is the glorious high priest. Therefore, we need to approach him the right way. Here's what it says in the, in the beginning of the book, Hebrews 1, 1 through 5. It says, God, after he spoke a long, a long ago to the fathers and the prophets in, the, and in many portions in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of God's nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When we had made purifications of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become a much better, uh, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Jesus. Yes, we know he was the suffering servant. Yes, we know that he died on the cross. Yes, we know that he was whipped and scourged at the pillar. But don't let that be your only image of Jesus. Jesus is also lofty, holy, high above all things, seated right next to the Father and has the ability. I, I love that Pastor AJ said earlier in the green room, he said, he said, we have access in Jesus because Jesus is the access. He is the access. In him, all things can be done. He says later on in verse 8, but, the, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is, is the scepter of his kingdom. He is his Son. We serve a God who is also a high priest. And this is important to understand, that the people who were receiving this word understood what high priests were about. As a matter of fact, the high priests or the Kohen Gadol in Hebrew, this was the chief of the officiating priests in the ancient temple of Jerusalem. The high priest was a member of the priestly caste, a descendant from Aaron who walked with Moses. The principal function of the high priest was the performance of Yom Kippur, service in the temple. The process described in the book of Leviticus requires the high priest to bathe himself to dress in special linen garment, garments, to attain atonement for the people of Israel. Yom Kippur was also the one day of the year when the high priest was permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies, the temple's innermost sanctum, where he sprinkled the blood of sacrificed animals. The book of Leviticus in chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, specifies a number of restrictions that apply to the high priest above and beyond those that apply generally to all priests. Most notably, the Torah bars the high priest from drawing near to any dead body, including those of his parents. And how about this? Though they couldn't come into contact with the dead, they also were prohibited to extend to close relatives. They should never attend a public feast, and his deputy should place himself between the high priest and the people. I read all that to say there was a major disconnect between the high priest and the people. Okay, we might not understand that because we have access. We can do whatever we want here in America. But it would be like going to church and Pastor Brett is untouchable. That's why I believe he goes outside of the service and walks outside those doors and shakes your hand and says hello because he wants to let you know I am not holier than you. I am not higher than you. I am with you. It's regular for us. But there would have been a time if we grew up in the Jewish priesthood where we were not able to even have a conversation or even be close with the high priest. And so because of that, they looked at a high priest when, when the writer says that Jesus is the high priest. Maybe there was an immediate sense of disconnection because I know what the high priest of my day is or was. But then the writer says, no, no, no. He is not a high priest that cannot sympathize. He can feel you because unlike the other high priests, he's been in your shoes. He's walked where you've walked. He's experienced your experiences. He's been tempted. And so though he is the high priest, he has the ability to be close with you. Man, if that won't make you be just, just, just be blown away 
that the God of all the universe cares for us. The, here, here comes Jesus after these high priestly rules. Here comes Jesus, and these, the, this is how, the, the, how he redeems these laws. Not, not needing to bathe. Jesus didn't need to bathe because he was eternally pure and spotless. He was not, needed to, not needing to dress in special garments as he is the embodiment of royalty. He's not needing to enter into a specific place, the holy of holies, because he is holy. Matter of fact, he is holiness. And not needing to sacrifice blood because he's got his own. And so what do we do with this? How do we reconcile a high priest, a holy God, yet we have our own issues? Many of us are broken. Many of us have pasts that haunt us to this day. Many of us have sin on the inside of us that we have not yet gotten free from. And, and we live in a dark cloud, under a dark cloud, desperate for breakthrough, desperate for transformation. Yet our Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the Trinity, they're doing a work around us and on the inside of us. Think about it. You're thinking to yourself, as the, as the enemy does often, you are not good enough. I've had times where I was in sin, and the, the enemy whispered to me, don't read your Bible because you're in sin. The very word of God that would help me break through and break free from the sin that I was struggling with, the enemy's whispering and saying, you're not good enough. I should have responded, and I may, may have responded well once or twice, but I should have responded by saying, that's the point. I'm not good enough. So I must open up the word because only his word is good, and his word will transform me from the inside out. <laughs> second, most important, uh, second important uh, part, his heart. His heart. Jesus is not just the God through his mind. He doesn't just love us through his mind. He doesn't just acknowledge us through his mind, through knowledge. He says, I love them. I sympathize. He is a sympathetic savior. How about this? Mark 6, 34. Jesus landed and saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them. Uh, Mark 1, 41. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man and saying, I am, the man said, I am willing uh, Matthew 14, 14, Jesus, uh, uh, Matthew 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Jesus cares. Matthew 20, 34, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. Jesus could have just done miracles and done work, but everything came from this heartfelt, deep Anchored compassion on the inside of his heart. Isaiah 57, one of my favorite verses, 57 verse 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell on a high and holy place, yet also with the contrite and lowly spirit. In order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. He lives on the high places. He exists in the high places, yet he desires to be right there with you. Only God can be on the throne and in your living room at the same time. Only God can hear the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty while hearing your cry in your car before you go to work. Only God, I, you got to get excited about this stuff. And I don't mean uh, fleshly excited, just trying to make some noise. I mean, I hope that there's something stirring up in your spirit that says, God, thank you. Thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for not, not forsaking me. Thank you for, for inviting me into this relationship with you. Yesterday, we were eating brunch, and my daughter Bailey came to me and rested on my lap. And... I realized she rested on my lap because she hadn't finished her food. <clears throat> and we're about finishing food in the greenhouse. I don't know how you do your house. But if we pay for it, if we made it, <laughs> eventually, you're going to eat it. <laughs> and so she, she, <laughs> she didn't finish her plate, but the other two did. And so I said, Bailey, come here, come here. Now, I'm working on, I'm, I'm growing in God, amen? Okay, so I didn't say, if you don't eat that, I didn't go there. I said, Bailey, come here, come here. She sat on my lap, I rubbed her back, 
and just we were playing. We did this for about 10 minutes. And after it was over, she went back and ate her food. Like, what in the world? How'd that happen? <laughs> what I realized was there was a rest that she entered into on daddy's lap. And in that rest, she, she forgot about everything, really. The only focus was daddy and rubbing her back, patting her back. And I believe that if we can have a moment like that in God, that in all of the craziness that's going on in the world, in all of the craziness that's going on in your house, in all of the craziness that's going on in the news, if you even watch that stuff, you can go and rest with daddy. And as you rest, here's what I believe. There was a faith transfer from me, from me to her. And that faith was, <laughs> there was some law in there too. But, but, but it was transferred and she had a desire to go eat her plate. Maybe she wanted to make daddy proud because of the intimacy that we had at that moment. Maybe she felt that, that the place not that big after all. I can eat. I don't know what was going on in her mind, but I know that she was empowered to go. So what I'm saying to you is if you're waiting for this transition, this big moment, this, this, this revival, the revival is in your rest. The revival is in your rest. You will discover the most powerful moments in your life when you surrender. I remember when I surrendered my, li surrendered my life to Jesus. At that time, I was at UVA, and I wasn't a good student. And at that time, I was trying to make the football team or trying to play on the football team. I was trying to do all these things. But as I surrendered my life to Jesus, everything started to fall in line. Now, that doesn't mean that everything started to, to, to be good, to be perfect. But it seemed like I had a transformation in my mind. Paul, uh, Paul says in Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There was something in his spirit that was renewing me. And I believe that in the rest of God, there's a renewal that happens on the inside of you. Amen? And to that point, there are things that you're not able to eat. You can't consume them. They're too big for you. But when you invite God into the equation, your capacity will grow. Maybe her stomach grew yesterday because of the love. But there's things, and hear me, people in this room have been saying, raise your hand. You know what? Put yourself out there. Raise your hand if you got a project or a personal thing that you've been working on and you've been telling people, it's coming, it's coming. Raise your hand. Okay, all right, good. Y'all know New Year's Eve is coming, but let's get it done today, right? So, so, so a lot of us are wrestling trying to get this thing done. I want you to try this new thing uh, because what you've been doing lately hasn't been working. And, and, and I'm very much so just like you. I got a book that's supposed to be published 2012. <laughs> I got friends like, hey, where's that book, man? I love it. Man, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> I done went through three computers. The same book is still trying to be written in Microsoft Word. Um, <laughs> but I believe that our next step is our best step, and our next step is jumping into the lap of God and resting. Because as we surrender in God, God will then give us the capacity. Maybe God didn't allow us to complete that task yet or to push that project yet because he wasn't in it. And so maybe when we start to surrender, not maybe, when we start to surrender, we will go into a deep place, the holy of holies, and God will empower us to push out that book, push out that business, reconcile with that family member, fix that marriage, uh, have, a, have a sit down with that child, and we will be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The sympathetic Savior. It says he's not a, uh, unable to sympathize because he had been tempted as well. Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted but could not sin. Notice this. He concluded a 40-day fast, which we would say, man, I'd be so weak at that moment. But I, I believe that what he was teaching us, because Jesus wasn't tempted in such a way that he would sin. He could not sin. He would not sin. It wasn't going to happen. But I believe that this was mostly for us as we watch the way that he warred in the spirit. He warred with what? The word of God. So the enemy tried to tempt him, and he, sh he, he, he shot back different shots of word and just sharing the word of God, sharing the word of God. When you drench your life in the word of God, there is nothing that can, that can crush you. And so he does all of this to equip us to do the same. But not only did he have the word, I believe what encourages me the most about this is he did it what we would call the physically, uh, most physical weakest moment after 40 days of fasting. 
How many of y'all know after five days of fasting, you're ready to sin? Whatever, whatever the sin is that comes your way, hey, I'm weak. Come on. <laughs> you throw on just shots in the dark. Like, <laughs> But Jesus teaches us this. It's not so much that he didn't eat. It's that he was disciplined. And so what I think the, 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 one of the great key points in this is the more that we are disciplined in God, the more that we'll be able to endure the temptation of sin. And so I want you to ask yourself this question very quietly. Don't say it out loud. When you fall into sin in the past, were you disciplined in that moment? Had you been prepared for that moment? I remember when I played uh, football um, at Southern University. Anybody uh, know about Southern University? The Jags? Okay, the Human Jukebox. So let me explain that. The Human Jukebox is our band. It's the greatest band in the world. Anyways, so, so, so um, it was 108 degrees outside. This is Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm running. We're in practice. And I start to feel a cramp in my, in my calf. Now, I'm a Virginia kid. We don't really have real heat. Everybody here who's complaining about heat, this ain't nothing compared to Texas and Louisiana. So that's like the weather when you go outside, then you got to go shower again. Then you go back outside, you, gotta, like you shower five times a day just to get the heat off you. And so um, I was there. I started cramping in my calf, and then I started cramping in my leg. And I said, hey, Doc, Doc, our, our, our trainer, I said, I I'm having a cramp. And he starts laughing. I said, man, give me some water. He said, water ain't going to save you. It's too late. You were supposed to drink last night. He said, whatever water you drink now is just for tomorrow. And aren't we the same way in the spirit? Oh, my goodness, I'm being tempted. Let me read something. <laughs> oh, man, there's something coming my way. Let me pray. Hey, I need to call you. Can we pray tonight? We should have been praying for six months. Want to pray with me tonight? I'm going to pray with you tonight, but, but, but we need to start praying regularly. Our church needs to be a church of discipleship, period, period. And discipleship is not a class. It's not a small group. It's not attending church. Discipleship is disciplining yourself and aligning yourself to those who are walking in Christ Jesus and, and making sure that as you walk, you are growing so that you could disciple the next person because a true disciple makes disciples. That's what discipleship is, period. And I'll close with this because I'm, I'm, I'm over. By the way, if you're sitting in these seats and you ever look back, shame on you. He got negative 352 right now. I think he need to close up. I'm going to add an extra minute just because you thought that. <laughs> the spirit tells me something sometimes. <laughs> Woo. Okay, let's close. <laughs> oh, man. Some of us grew up in church where you didn't have this luxury of these short services. You better go ahead, getting all uptight about five extra minutes. You better sit, sit, sit down. Stay in the presence of God and enjoy it. So you can have enough ready on Thursday when your boss says whatever he says. Anyway, okay. By the way, we're going to take an offering after this, and you better stay in your seat. Keep these aisles clean for the ushers. All right. His Holiness, an invitation written in blood. <laughs> How do you end with after what I just said? Okay, bring it back. Bring it back. His Holiness, an invitation written in blood. An invitation written in blood. Jesus never sinned. Uh, we serve a perfect God. There is no flaw, nor is there any evil. His pure blood was rich in goodness, love, and power. Oh, what a God we serve whose perfection in all of who he is, his perfection performed a great work on the inside of us, so great that we will be transformed forever. I don't care who you are. If you stand by LeBron James, no matter what he does, there is nothing that will be transferred, on, transferred onto you that you would be able to play basketball. <laughs> if you stand by TD Jakes, there is nothing that he can put on you that makes you preach really well. 
If you, if you stand next to whoever your favorite person is, wherever your talented person, there's nothing. But Jesus, we serve a God who even in his perfection, his blood poured out, it has the ability to move on the inside of you, transform the inside of you, and change the trajectory of your life and every generation that's on the inside of you. Represented. What a God we serve. If you didn't hear anything that I said today, know this, that our God is glorious, exalted above all things. Jesus, Emmanuel, he's also Lord with us. And he sympathizes with our pain, with the sin that tempts us. And because of that, we now are empowered by the Holy Spirit to endure. And as we stay in the rest of God, in his good rest, we will be able to conquer all things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.